That's right. Hi, everybody. Thank you for staying for discussion, and I see the crowd has uh, sort of exploded. <laughs> um, We've had a very interesting sort of session, especially those of you who were with us yesterday. Uh, you know, and, and this session is interesting because markedly you, you see the presence of curators, of uh, organizers, of uh, artistic projects, of people uh, who, in a sense, are facilitators, are mediators, the people who fan the flames uh, of art. Uh, and the perspective is, is very, very distinctive. Uh, as a start, I want to ask a kind of general question before uh, we go into slightly more detail. What seems very interesting to me uh, in all the presentations today was this idea of how artistic projects, you know, uh, that all our, our uh, presenters are involved in, they somehow have a kind of response or are developed in a, a kind of conversation with a specific context. And that context is neat not necessarily be, a ge be geographical. Of course, it can be cultural, but uh, like with Uma Shankar, it was very interesting because I thought the most interesting context that was being developed was that of how we experience uh, that particular sort of art form in, in that case. The fact that our context, we are unable to experience uh, those kinds of music in the exactly the same kind of way uh, that you know, uh, when that music was first performed in those historical sites. So I want to ask in the context of the purpose that each of our, our presenters, in, ter in terms of the purpose that you have set yourself uh, for what, why you do what you do, uh, what is the relationship to the context? I mean, why choose, uh, you know, with Mami, for instance, her presence, you know, why choose these kinds of disparate uh, scenes, you know, that you were doing in your in your research, and does it does it add up? <laughs> Do all these have a kind of thread that adds up? Um, and uh, I think various. So I'll just like to throw that open quickly for each of you to just say a little bit. While uh, the uh, your presentation is still very fresh in everybody's uh, sort of mind, maybe we just start from this end and go down. I think um, my project certainly came from this. Um, expanding distance between ever diversifying uh, the context from different parts of the world and a different time, and even on uh, it's, so it's not only about Asia when we ha have this any kind of exhibition, and uh, and then when, on the other hand we have expanding audience for the contemporary art, and then stronger pressure for this major institutions to have more visitors and more people to come in. But uh, as more you have these to general public, meaning much less sort of common ground of the understanding of art history or sort of social history. So how do you connect these two? And uh, But one way is to make a very general sort of introductory sort of exhibition, but at the same time, I needed something much in depth so that, uh, um, but with a lot of information so that if you are trying to engage, you can still understand what they are talking about. So uh, that's one of the many ways of solving those conditions. And with, with Nora's project, it's a slightly, it's from the other side, right? Whereas Mami really was about going deep into very specific uh, sort of localized scenes, but the project that you presented, in a sense, was about a kind of larger canvas and finding sort of common threads that sort of tied them together. Yeah, I mean, as I mentioned, the museum reopened a year ago. Um, it's an old institution, but at the same time, it's, it's new in people's consciousness. So for me, uh, right now is the process of kind of laying the foundations of, of the relationship of the museum to its publics, to the city, um, and kind of building it as a public space, as a space of discourse, a space of interaction, and kind of, of thinking about the kind of regimes of visibility in the city. So who gets to talk where, who's represented how, etc. cetera. Um, so for me, yeah, like I said, it's really about um, creating a public space in a city that really doesn't have much public space. 
And it was uh, interesting. I thought the the um, exercise that you you had us do, and I want to ask a very obvious question, which is. Uh, what you made us go through was obviously coming from a very specific uh, kind of, of practice, a specific kind of tradition. Is it important that we understand where you're coming from in order for, um, in a sense, what you made us do, do you think, to have its impact? And I'm saying this in the context of as an art maker, uh, an exhibition maker, we are often asked, you know, so if we only do something in relation to a particular context, does it have relevance to people who are unaware of that context? You know, it's a kind of tiresome question that keeps getting asked of curators and artists. And, and at the back of that, there is that strange sort of idea that somehow we must be global. You know, and global means certain things. Great question. I want, I want to answer your first question first about why I do this. because. Um, I firmly believe that uh, the increasing of human consciousness will improve the world, and, and, and each one of us can in, in raise our level of consciousness, and it increases our level of compassion, our level of empathy, our level of self-awareness and self-understanding. Um, that being said, uh, the tradition isn't important. What's important is uh, we get beyond the conditioned mind, which is what the exercise was meant to do, was to sort of help us you know, break for five seconds the ongoing mind, clear that space, and get into a deeper place inside of ourselves where the truth lives. And each person, hopefully, who went through that journey felt something inside that was from them. It wasn't from me. No one, not, I didn't say what to feel, what to think. You know, it was hopefully people who went through that experience found something deeper within themselves. And that's what it's really all about, is uncovering, getting past our, our normal conditioning to a, a deeper uh, sense of ourselves. And then using that, hopefully, to create the art. Because be, that should be deeper. The, I, I think it's interesting that, that uh, to consider what you made us do as also a kind of, very clearly, a kind of aesthetic process that's quite similar to, to how, in a sense, exhibitions mm -hmm. Uh, are curated, you know. So uh, let's leave it there and go to uh, Funa. Um, your work, um, it was very provocative. It was very provocative. And you are and primarily, and you are, in a sense, you are clearly, uh, you know, creating work that is, in a sense, I thought, it, it, for me, it linked that with what Uma uh, had been presenting. In a sense, you are going, you are responding to a particular kind of, I won't say expectation, but a particular kind of state of being of the audience that, that, that you are, are after. And it was very interesting, somewhere along your presentation to me, you mentioned the fact that, you know, where you're coming from with uh, in Yunnan, you know, Lijiang, there is also those of us that come from outside have a kind of exotic expectation yeah. Of, yeah. of that. But your, your work is actually sort of refuting that, is sort of yeah. resisting that. Yeah. Could you say a little bit more about, you know, why you chose these kinds of, frankly, very consumerist, and the word that you use actually was trashy, <laughs> kind of images as really examples of a, a sort of honest response to what uh, this particular generation is, is, is inhabiting. Yeah, because uh, when we first uh, come to the village and uh, everybody describing the, you know, the historical, the, the cultural significance of the, the building and of course the, the village is beautiful and it's very yeah, it's, it still have a very historical element and uh, the ethnic element. But uh, uh, in my work, I try to avoid uh, all this, this kind of image to appear because um, uh, what really catch my eyes is what the, the villagers really think about. It's not like they want to show us. It's, the, it's not like a, an act. It's the real fact of the, uh, of the, the village, what is happening there. And uh, for me, it's like um, it's it's a reflection of a, of a, uh, what what the what the people are thinking now, like what uh, what I'm thinking now, because um, I think at the old time, um, I don't know uh, when when I was a, a little child, 
uh, I was very accepting to go to McDonald's to eat hamburg, but uh, now it seems crazy. And uh, I, when I first uh, come to America and I come to uh, New York, and I went to a McDonald's shop, I found only homeless people and uh, poor people <laughs> eat there. <laughs> it's very, it's a very sad moment because I always think something is, uh, yeah, is 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 over my imagination. It's it's not about. It's not about the taste. It's about the representation of, um, you know, the the uh, it's a it's a remark of the the international. It's the, it's a remark of the the highly like 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 the the happy life. <laughs> so that the kind of thought is uh, is still in the the, the village and uh, and also um, because they need to. Uh, they need to live as the, uh, how to say? They they need to live as the, uh, the traditional way. But it's not. They want to live as the traditional way because people want to protect them. They they want to them to have this this tradition, keep the tradition. But what they really think is because there is a lots of foreigner, lots of outsider is coming there, and so they thinking is change. So. It's it's very it's very real in that fact that even I know the protecting the the land is important, but uh, the struggling is happening there. So I just want to show the reality. Yeah. So it's 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 not necessarily one or the other, but almost like parallel performances yeah. are going on, right? I mean, you mentioned about how they would dress up in the day, uh, in particular costumes, and at night. They yeah. <laughs> they go back and become uh, the sort of you know late 20th century, 21st century uh, kind of urban uh, youth. Yes, you know? and and I think your your work does express that kind of you know two parallel lives or three kinds of lives running on. Yeah. Um, now, Erin, uh, I have to confess because I've worked with Erin uh, before, but um, I wanted to ask you a kind of you know, given that you have worked in the context of Cambodia with all its its very complex and sometimes very tortured kind of history, in a sense, do you see the art or you know or do you see artistic practice ever escaping that kind the shadow of that kind of trauma? And I say this because uh, with art scenes like this, particularly, non-Western art scenes, a lot of times curators and, and, and art historians have a kind of, almost like a, I wouldn't say a genocide fetish, <laughs> as, if, as if all art you know, was a result of that trauma. And uh, an example not from visual art, when I first went to Cambodia you know, to look at uh, actually traditional dance, you know, that is related to the Ramayana and the Mahabharata. You know, the first thing I was told for a week was that of Sihanouk's sort of group of dancers, only one person survived, you know, literally at the end. And that every performer I met would somehow at some point tell me this story as a kind of reason for why they are practicing what they are. And this is not visual art, this is... Uh, in the realm of dance. So I want to ask Erin, given you know your long experience, will it or should it? <clears throat> yes, I, I think the work of, um, well, let me start with dance. Um, first of all, it's a, it's a very small scene and we are really, we draw on each other's resources. We collaborate a lot between dance, architecture, visual arts, music. Um, You'll see in a lot of artworks, um, it's really multi-authored. Um, and this, I think, relates somehow to the culture, but somehow also to this history. So um, there is this presence of absence. This was uh, a big you know, part of one of the panels yesterday. Um, and because of that, relating to your work, it, it is a concern and almost a priority for many artists, contemporary artists, to preserve um, it's not just a, you know, we can say it's maybe a colonial hangover because the, the French um, kind of reconstituted all of Cambodian history as only Angkorian history. Um, and so a very particular period of time is then what was inherited. 
um, by the independence regime and by subsequent regimes. So it's only really in the last century um, they are still, of course, interested to preserve because of uh, you know this this history. At the same time, um, I think people are very interested in filling in, right? So um, I was just at, studying at SOAS with Dr. Ashley Thompson. She looks at you know it's called the Dark Ages, or it was, and now it's called the Middle Period, um, and this is a post Angkorian period, and maybe uh, a position in history that you know has the continuities that we're seeing, um, you know more lived out today than perhaps that Angkorian period. So a lot of things were constructed, you know, for the identity of, of Cambodia as a part of Indochine, which is a very different regime in Laos and in, in Vietnam. Every, every um, you know, non-nation at that time played different roles. So Cambodia performed the past. And yes, for sure, contemporary artists um, want to update. You know, they want to show the changes that they're living through. Um, but these are not just thinking about the future or even the present, but you know, in connection, you know, with with time, this kind of time travel. You know, if you're thinking about film or cinema, like jump cutting and, and cross cutting and kind of dream spaces. And so there's a lot of um, you know, there's a lot of fiction there. But in fact, it's a it's a highly documentary practice, I think, because they want to hold um, this time in in the absence of uh, being having access to archives. Somebody said yesterday. Um, you know, the, the history is there, the archive is there, just go take whatever you want. And, you know, that's a very privileged position because, you know, a lot of people, um, spaces do not have archives. You know, France is holding most, most of the archives. Um, so, yeah. yeah. I think that's, that's very interesting that, that it is sometimes not about, in a sense, using history or using the archives or so on. It's actually about building the archive. And, it's about and building the building archive. the history that mm. it's not mm. just about expressing identity but actually building that point. identity uh, and and that's i i mean personally that's a, a kind of long running debate i've always had with uh, curators from Europe and America who are trained in a certain tradition that they don't understand it's not something that is already there that you could unproblematically sort of work with, that is something that artists and curators and are actually building. Yes. Yeah. And, and doing that through you know, their own experience. So yesterday, um, um, the artists from Palestine were talking about the lived experience. And this is very much um, you know, where a lot of artists um, in, I'm most familiar with mainland Southeast Asia, where they're coming from, is the lived experience of themselves, their families, their grandmother's stories, um, and often still cohabitating. And so this kind of very rich history is, is kind of a living archive, you know, rather than having to go and, and to the National Archives and source a document. Although some, some artists now start to begin um, to think, you know, about um, historicizing in those ways as well. So, Uma Shankar. Yeah. Um, your, going back to the, the point I made, I, th I was very fascinated by your, your line when you talked about how our capacity, modern audiences, because our environment, our oral environment is actually very different. So our, as a result, our experience and our access to, in a sense, how we interpret that past history of how we experience that art form, in a sense, that musical performance is, is different. So can you say a bit, therefore, what are you trying to do? You know, what, what does it matter to contemporary practice and contemporary audiences that we are made aware through work such as what you have described that we don't, in a sense, experience that space or that art form in the same way anymore? And sometimes as simple as the fact that we cannot hear as many things or even as you say we can't even see as many stars as we could you know a few hundred years ago or a thousand years ago i'll start by saying a little bit about myself it'll give you an idea of why what i'm trying to do i have worked in an archives of indian music ethnomusicology archive with about 25000 hours of recordings for 34 years started with four audio cassettes of music i had recorded and it Basically, and every day these 34 years, I've heard about six to seven hours of music. Not all of it enjoyable, because it's <laughs> traditional music. And, but the thing I learned was every one of those performers has spent his entire life practicing that as a skill and an art. And I have no right to disparage or not take care of what they did. 
and uh, it gives you a certain uh, it is not it doesn't make me humble it makes me sort of aware of responsibility and when i went to rani gumpha and i heard the sound of that space i felt there has to be a way i could represent this to people see the archives you can go and take out the tapes and then a good database you can find the material that you want to hear and it's accessible but these spaces the spaces where the performances took place are not in accessible you have to go there and some of them are no, badly kept they are not identified rani gumpha is not identified as a theater and uh, my saying so will not make much difference to the archaeological societies and i'm not concerned with it well i stopped calling it theater i stopped I said performance space because there are and then uh, you, so you have several aims one of them is in some way recreate that space in anybody's headphones so that i don't have to say please go to orissa go to bhuvaneshwar where the temperature is only 140 degrees when it's cool and <laughs> it's very sweaty but uh, you can enjoy the aesthetics of that space you can see the photographs for we have always had a visual preference for these things in fact it's a major problem that we will take pictures and not even think about what does it sound like you know there who percy smith wrote about maybe this is a theater but he never mentions the extraordinary acoustics of that space and nobody has and you know and so then you say this cannot be the only space there are many many spaces some of them are contemporary for instance i know a, cl- a great classical musician who died about 10 or 15 years ago in near indore and uh, his practice hall represented one kind of acoustic preference he had for an instrument called tanpura with which he accompanied himself and that hall the, the sound is extraordinarily bright because he wanted the instrument to be bright so that he could sing against it now it is still there but one day suddenly his children or grandchildren or somebody will say we'll build a multi story building it's a very important property it won't be there so if i could just measure and preserve the space of this performance space i would be doing you know the, the, and there are many spaces like this and all over the world there's one in france where pe- people have responded to it you know there's one cave in france where the paintings are in darkness most of the cave paintings are in complete darkness people take a torch and go and paint in one particular space and they paint in the same space again and again he did a statistical analysis of the acoustic properties of a space and the number of times a painting was done and there's a direct correlation and after this was established somebody decided to build a hotel in a mountain opposite <laughs> and uh, he was able to establish that the reverberation in the cave is actually the result of reflection from that mountain don't take that mountain away because that is part of this cave's property it is an acoustic property it is not a picture and you see this these things will happen you know and you can't prevent people from building things you can't prevent people from painting over you know i i showed you that picture of the uh, bushes planted in front of rani gumpa you see it's visually di- disgusting but it's, i don't know what it has done to audio because i have not gone back there i only seen the photograph well because because i suppose what you say the the sort of impact of something like that you know on the space on the experience of space is frankly in a sense not something that people know about it it's like irrelevant or not yeah. not in their world even, view uh, uh, yeah. even people who are archaeologists people who are historians have never really thought about what did it sound like i mean <laughs> <laughs> no especially archaeologists but that's another another sort of uh debate well we're doing a big archaeology project in the spring that's why <laughs> sorry i'm a bit obsessed with archaeology at the moment so we are running a uh, very short of time i just want to end by uh, a very simple question to bring us back to to the present to the construction of the contemporary and the construction of the future i just want to quickly uh, ask all our our, our panelists to in one or two lines just say a bit about i mean so given all that you've said what do you think is is the purpose of your your practice moving forward given what is happening or you know recently uh to the world and and you know we've we've been through all this you know 10 years ago we were talking about the end of the arts you know even in the 80s we're saying you know this is the materialistic 80s the, the end of the art when the mega museums were built all the independence spaces were saying you know this is the end you know we're all going to turn into a kind of mcdonaldization of the the museum and these vast halls you know 
Um, so just like to throw that around. I'll just say look around. We're seeing uh, globally uh, xenophobia, whether it's the Philippines, whether it's the United States, whether it's Europe, um, people more fear and less love. So I think it's up to us to turn up the love inside of each one of us and to really express that in our world um, and overcome all the fear that we're seeing everywhere in every aspect of our lives and everything we do in every moment, but especially through our work that's going to live uh, far beyond us. Um, I mean, I think, you know, to continue to do what we do is really important. Um, but also, I'm just reminded of something I heard once, which I thought was really um, a good way of putting things, is that very few people have a voice and many people have an echo. So I think it's really important to think about how you can create a voice um, that you know, speaks to and connects with other people. Um, I don't think uh, contemporary art is the only way to do something, but uh, I, I do think that uh, it's one of the fields that are different uh, people can come in and then talk about uh, the common issues. Then uh, I think it's also one way of seeing the seeing the whole world from the bigger picture, and uh, instead of. Uh, having yourself in the center of the context, but I think yeah. it's important to see yourself also as a part of the whole, then uh, start finding how we are connected. I'm gonna follow that because um, I agree that I think the, the artist has the position that's kind of um, the choice of being a bit outside of citizenship or outside of nationhood as, as a very privileged, privileged position of you know, being, being radar and having antennas, and um, it's my job to, you know, extend um, what they feel, you know, oftentimes before when it's happening. And so I think my practice is really built on just responding to artists. And so I, that's, that's my job, you know, and that will be my job in the future and this continuing this mediation project, <laughs> uh, you know, over time. Yeah, I w I was willing to like connect with people, and uh, uh, I think uh, for me the most important thing is uh, trying to um, trying to uh, see the ordinary people's view, and uh, trying to um, trying to not just showing my art to the you know to the this art circle of people, but to to trying to uh, make it in the boredom way, in the daily way, and uh, trying to express this, or <coughs> to express the people's view to the art circle, yeah. I'm hoping to get a lot of people to do what I'm doing, <laughs> first thing. But, um, that's why I'm working in building low-cost equipment, because that's one way of making it possible is to make it low-cost. And as for a long-term aim, I would say that you see, when we study people's ability to listen to things or their ability to discern pictures, what we are actually studying is mind. Human minds are actually quite interesting and all these are just little external aspects of what is going on inside. And I, I'm, I want to study that. that. That actually is finally, whether you're studying music, you're studying painting, you're actually looking at what makes them tick, what they, what do, why do they want to paint? Where do they want to think? I mean, they spend so much time learning to think. Thank you. Thank you. And on that, that note, I'd like to thank all our panelists. We end on a very uh, human note. Uh, what makes us tick now probably is lunch. So um, thank you all. And I'd like to thank all my wonderful uh, panelists uh, today to share, you know, of not just their personal kind of practice, their perspective on that, but their own sort of very personal uh, you know, subjective views on, on how they view uh, their role uh, in this crazy sort of world and crazy art scene that we're in. So thank you all and we'll see everybody after lunch, I hope. It's too cold outside, so I'm sure you will want to come back. Uh, to the